So let me start a little bit with the introduction of who Melanie Mitchell is. Uh, she is a, prof a Davis Professor of Complexity at Santa Fe Institute, and her research uh, focuses on conceptual abstraction, analogy making, and visual recognition. She's done a couple of uh, very uh, popular and well-received books. Uh, the first one was Oxford University Press in 2009, Complexity, A Guided Tour, her most recent book is Artificial Intelligence, A Guide for Thinking Humans. And I have to say the people uh, who've talked about the Artificial Intelligence book have said some very, uh, very good things. Uh, for example, uh, we have Alison Gopnik, who says it's very intelligent, clear, and sensible book. Uh, Jeffrey West at Santa Fe has said it's remarkably lucid, Comprehensive Overview, Sean Carroll, an astonishing intelligence, and John Paulus, who's been on the show, says that uh, Mitchell sketches enough details and clever, clever illustrations that one gets a good intuitive understanding of AI. So you have high praise from some of the titans of uh, a number of different disciplines. And I think that's a good way to take the next step. The next step is I'm in conversation with someone who is familiar with at least three important domains, uh, mathematics, physics, and computer science, and as well as artificial intelligence, which I would put in as part of the computer uh, science uh, part of this. So, I see from my research of your, your background is you really have excelled as an interpreter, as someone who's been able to translate between these domains. And as a result, we'll be looking a little later in the show about how your childhood reading and those books helped you create this kind of ability to map and track other thought processes in other domains and make them accessible to ordinary people. Yeah, so um, we humans are all masters of analogy, even when we don't know it. Sure. So let's think about uh, a, a kind of unconscious analogy. One example that I use is the notion of a bridge. You know, we all know what a bridge is, we all drive across bridges or we walk across bridges, whatever. But we also talk about bridges like the bridging the gender gap or the bridge of a song or the bridge of my nose or, uh, you know, there's all kinds of ways in which these terms are used metaphorically or uh, by analogy throughout language, even unconsciously. But this kind of ability we have to extend concepts in this metaphorical way, and it's not just bridge, you could do it with almost any concept we, yeah. you want to talk about, uh, is, I claim, what gives us our unique kind of intelligence. It allows us to understand more and more abstract notions in terms of very physical notions. Like you, you just said, you know, she has sunny face. Right. So we all instantly know what that means. Yes. And we know, um, we don't even think of it necessarily as a metaphor. We, it's just right. so, you know, I might say, oh, you gave me such a warm introduction, you know, and it was, it was, it wasn't literally warm, right? Sure. <laughs> the temperature in this room didn't literally go up, I don't think. But uh, <laughs> it, it's something that we, we all couch all of our abstract thinking in. And this is exactly what AI systems today are lacking. They can learn to recognize photos of bridges, yeah. but they can't make that extension and talk about, you know, a bridge, uh, a bridge between two people. You know, sure. you and I are here. You maybe you're bridging us the culture of science with the culture of humanities or things, something like that. So that's fascinating to me. And that's what my research is on is trying to understand how human concepts um, 
are formed, how, what kind of structure they have, and how we might give such a concept to a machine. Yeah, it would. It, it w presumably we're some ways away from AI understanding it's raining cats and dogs, or, <laughs> or yeah, or, absolutely, or, or or she has a heart of gold. I mean, yeah, we don't. We one problem with. Uh, talking about AI is that we, when we talk about understanding, we don't really know exactly what we mean. What is it to understand something? Sure. That's actually been debated quite a bit by philosophers for millennia. And it's really uh, a, an unanswered question. It's one of those words we use to describe our mental state that we yes. don't quite understand scientifically what it means. But I think in terms of kind of the sort of intuitive understanding we have of that, that notion, you're absolutely right. Machines don't have the same kind of understanding of, of language that we humans have. I, I, I'm wondering as well if part of the, that issue has to do with, uh, you, you've written uh, about uh, GPT-3 making analogies in Medium, and uh, you've said that uh, with metaphors, there isn't a right answer there's an effective explanation or description that convey information. It's really a conveyor from the abstract to the concrete, but it's not, you can't really say it's a hundred percent right. Uh, it, it can be close to right. What goes back to what you were talking about a moment ago is how we understand that transition from the abstract into something that's concrete. Are, is it giving us, with that similarity, a true representation from the, what the abstract really means? Yeah, it, yeah, it's, uh, you know, machines, uh, they've been shown to be what, what people in AI call very brittle, meaning that they, they have this kind of appearance of being intelligent until suddenly something shows you very clearly it's like it's a breaking point and that's why it's brittleness that they didn't understand at all what you what you know the language they were using meant maybe part understand. of this is yeah, go ahead. W w one of my uh uh favorite uh things i i saw on social media some time ago was someone had taken an apple and written the word ipad on a piece of paper and put that on the apple with a rubber band and then ask an AI uh, for questions uh, or for answers to what this is. And it said with 90% 90 90 probability, it's an iPod. <laughs> right. <laughs> so that, that kind of literalism, you can see is it's uh, uh, part of that inability to deal with analogies and metaphors. And again, you, you've talked about in uh, how analogy shape our thoughts, what happens if you strip away metaphors, simile, and analogies from language? What is left? What, are we left just with abstractions? Is that the part of the problem that we have with storytelling AIs is that they lack the essential building blocks of how you tell a story, which basically is the bricks of that, that building of that story really are metaphorical, a lot of them. That's one of the problems, for sure. Another problem is that AI systems don't understand how the world works. You know, they don't know that, um, they don't know that, it, you know, if uh, a, a, a child is holding an ice cream cone and then the ice cream cone falls on the ground, Right. that that would be upsetting because how are they going to know that they haven't experienced the world the way that we have they don't even know that uh you know when an ice cream cone hits the ground that it's going it's not edible anymore that right. you wouldn't want to eat it <laughs> how would they know that so. yeah well it goes back to what you've written about as well of saying that the problem with ai is it lacks common sense exactly. and co Common sense is if you drop the ice cream cone, even a four-year-old knows it's no longer something you want to eat, where an AI system would not have that particular uh, 
uh, response because it's not an embodied biological entity that learns certain things about food from a very early age. That's exactly right. So uh, that's the you know that's one of the big problems is how do you get all, a, a system like uh, GPT three or any other AI system to get that kind of knowledge about the world that we all have you know as children we all yeah. learn so much by just living and existing in the world. But, you know, p part of what you've written that, uh, that that strikes me as very interesting as well is that a lot of the analogy making we have comes from an unconscious part of our brains. In other words, when you start to think of analogies, they will come to you. And if I ask, well, where did that come from? Probably don't really know. It's just, it's been triggered by some, some gesture, some thought, something that you're not really connected to. You can make up a story of why you access that, but it's just that, it's just a story. You don't really know. So. AI does not have an unconscious uh, matrix in which to draw upon to pull those analogies and metaphors from uh, a huge reservoir. I mean, presumably that material for analogy making is as close to infinite as a human can get to. And as a result, it's very hard, I would think, to program into a computer intelligence and analogy making function because it goes much deeper than just being able to calculate precisely what the next best move is in chess or goal or atari right it it our analogy making comes in part from the fact that we have this huge store of memories yes and you know, if you might, you probably have the experience where somebody tells you a story and you say something like, oh, the same thing happened to me. Yes. Right. And of course, the same thing literally didn't happen to you because you're not that other person. Sure. But you, something about their story triggers a memory that you somehow mapped onto the um, story that they just told you. Right. That happens to us all the time every day you know someone says something about their life and you say oh yeah me too right and that's like you know you're making an analogy between their life and your life and it's just constant but it has to do with an interaction between our perceptual abilities mm -hmm. our our memories our pattern recognition uh facilities and so on and this is something we haven't yet figured out how to give to machines i'm wondering of, as well whether that uh, exchange also falls under the heading of empathy, which is something a machine doesn't have, is that you will say, oh, that's similar because you have a theory of mind about that person. You can put yourself in that position and see that as, as happening to you and that you would have had a similar response to a particular event or an object or uh, a gesture. Yeah, that's absolutely right. And you know, one of the things about humans is they're incredibly socially oriented, meaning that they're always trying to understand other people and uh, that, that they encounter from the earliest infancy, and mm -hmm. they're able to put themselves in the position of other people. So that's something that, um, again, is very human. And so perhaps essential for intelligence. You know, we don't know. Usually AI people often think of intelligence as something kind of separable from things like empathy and emotions, and it's just right. sort of pure rationality. But I think a lot of people are now kind of try, trying to make sense of how the centrality of these more emotional aspects of our intelligence. Right. Well, what I'd like now to do with, with this background in terms of metaphors, and analogies, to uh, move on to your reading list, which uh, I hope that we'll be able to get into how this may have been a training, training set, an education for you into the world of metaphor, simile, and analogy making. So let's start with... Uh, Really, your, 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 your background, your first books, uh, your, you know, you're at home, 
it was the first books from your, your mother or your father or a sibling. I mean, how did you come to first have that book, that first book in your hand? The, the first book? Yeah. In other words, we, we look at the first book on the list, which is oh. The Phantom Tooth uh, Toll Book, yeah. which is an absolutely wonderful book. I'm so glad you chose that. I can't wait to get into it. But let's, let's just start for a moment. And how, how did you come to have that book in your possession? And how old were you? Wow, I was, uh, I'm guessing I was about eight or nine, something okay. like that. Yeah. And I really don't remember at all how I got that book. Okay. Who gave it to me or anything. But uh, somehow it, it, it appeared, sort of like the phantom toll booth in the book, just suddenly <laughs> appeared. No one knew where it came from. <laughs> Did you grow up in a reading environment where your parents were reading or siblings were reading and then that uh, kind of storytelling from reading was kind of a natural uh, bridge from one to the other you're reading books you're telling stories you're reading books you're yeah uh, my my um parents both were avid readers and um read read to us right. uh, from earliest childhood right uh and um, I, I just, I can't remember any time when I couldn't read or didn't spend most of my time reading. <laughs> so I loved reading as a child. I did too. <laughs> That's why I'm doing this show. <laughs> and I, I, I think that the people who have that experience are fortunate uh, for a lot of reasons, because it does ground, uh, I think, a person in the ability to uh, be curious about stories, about other people's stories, and to learn from them and to apply that learning to new and novel situations. Yeah. Which, which is, you know, basically that's so much of what you're doing as well is uh, how do you deal with surprise? And how you deal with surprise is, is something that you can learn through the experiences of characters in books. You can see that experience as something, oh, that person was surprised. They reacted in this way. And that has a profound implication for your, your own feeling about security in the world, how I would react. Mm -hmm. So yeah. The Phantom Tollbooth by Norton Jester. <clears throat> you know, he, he just, just recently died in March uh, of this year at age 92, but he left behind this absolutely wonderful book. You know, there's the little bo bored boy named Milo, who you know, has this kit, which he has to assemble, which is toll booth. Comes with it two just toll appears also, that was very, it's, uh, Magically uh, striking appears. to me that it, this thing just appeared in his bedroom. Right. Where did okay. it come from? <laughs> exactly. So that's the first question you're asking at eight or nine, right? Is how did Milo end up with this uh, kit in his room? So what does he do with that? He puts it together. He assembles it, right? So there's a, immediately kind of an, an engineering puzzle-making aspect to the book which I, almost all the scientists I've talked to, there's some book like that. Here is a puzzle. If I put it together, what representation do I see? Mm -hmm. And so for Milo, he also has a little electric car. So once he's assembled the toll booth, mm -hmm. he's got the map, the rules, two tokens, drops one in, takes off and starts driving. And I could see where your love and passion for metaphor and analogy would have started at eight or nine with this book. I mean, a, a dog's body shaped like a cock, a watchdog. Uh, right. This, that was another thing. It was all the wordplay and yeah. puns was, was just so enchanting. 
So, so yeah, I mean, the, 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 uh, there you go. You're starting starting to see that that word play, a clock body for a dog, a watchdog, and then a bug that just brags and brags about its own uh, abilities and claims which aren't true, which is a humbug. (laughs) And so Milo basically teams up with these two, doesn't he? The humbug and the watchdog to go on an adventure and they end up in the empire of wisdom. Uh, But the problem is there's no rhyme or reason. Right, the princesses. (laughs) Exactly, the two sisters. Yes. So they set out for a quest to rescue them, right? Mm -hmm. And to bring the two sisters, rhyme and reason, back into the empire of wisdom. And again, you know, part of the wordplay here is quite wonderful is on their journey, you know, uh, running into uh, the mountain of ignorance where there's the ever present word snatcher, which is quite uh, the person who's constantly interrupting them. Uh, The terrible triumphant waste time doing unimportant and trivial task the sense taker the person who wastes time filling out countless wasteful forms to no particular end so ultimately they they succeed right milo oh, and yes. the humbug and the watchdog uh, yes uh by rescuing the the two sisters rhyme and reason mm-hmm. now what out of that, uh, the Phantom of Tollbooth, if you can kind of recreate what it was that in your mind as you read it as a child, how you process that. I mean, you're processing some things which for a kid could be a little bit maybe frightening, like demons. And some yeah. of the de- demons are described in quite vivid detail, long nose, green eyed, curly haired, wide mouth thick neck, broad-shouldered, round-bodied, short-armed, bow-legged, big-footed monster. That's the demon of insecurity or ins- insincerity. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that, I mean, part of the book I remember were s- some wonderful illustrations by Jules Pfeiffer. Right. I mean, I didn't know who he was when I was, you know, that yeah, a yes. child, but I certainly knew him later on. And, and they were fantastically evocative and terrifying, some of them. <laughs> I still remember that there was a, a, a man who had no face. I don't know if you saw that one, but that was a really terrifying thing. Right, right. So it introduced uh, a wordplay world and a visual world in between the covers of the same book. Yes. Yes, and and there were you know uh, I, there were two kind of two different cities. One was concerned with words, and the other was concerned with numbers. Right. So that this kind of uh, separation between sort of the world of numbers and the world of words was one that I think I already was starting to resonate with because I felt like I had sort of interests in both in both that- of those worlds. That's that's interesting. So uh, here's a child book, uh, the Phantom uh, Toll Booth, which actually opens up uh, a window to two different kinds of cultures. Mm-hmm. There's the culture of language and words, and then there's the culture of mathematics and numbers. And there's a there are borderlines between those. But here is an author who's able to cross those borders at will, going from numbers <laughs> to representations, representations to numbers. That had to be a thrilling thing for you as a child. Yeah, I remember really, really being struck by that idea that these things were, you know, they were very separate and that, uh, and there was this, you know, I, I'm sort of only vaguely remembering a lot of this book, I have to admit. Yeah. <laughs> 
But that's one of the things that was striking to me. That's interesting. So this is a book that I presume you would recommend for, for parents and teachers and others. If you want to inspire a young person in the world yeah. of metaphor and analogies and mathematical objects, this is, this is a place to start because it, it is accessible. It's very accessible and ki children love it. I, I read it to my own two children uh, many years ago. <laughs> and they, I, I don't know if they loved it as much as I did, but uh, I remember them that they, they, they found it quite amusing, all the word play and right. um, puns and everything. That, that's interesting. So the tradition of the first book on your list that you read as a child, mm -hmm you made a point of sharing that experience with your own two children mm -hmm. in order to pass along, which you hope would be a similar kind of experience. Yeah. And I haven't asked them if they remember that book, I should ask them someday. <laughs> no, you, 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 I think it, it would be interesting to, to go back uh, for parents to go back to children, particularly if they're, late teens or, or, or early adults and say, do you remember when I, when we sh read this book together, <laughs> do, do you have any memories of this? Did it have yeah. any impact on your life? Because it had an impact on mine. I was on a conversation with someone on a talk show where I talked about this book and I talked about you. <laughs> right. <laughs> Full circle. Right. <laughs> yeah, I'll ask them. <laughs> <laughs> the next book, another uh, wonderful selection, is A Wrinkle in Time by Madeline Laingo. Uh, again, uh, I'll give just a little bit of an introduction because I don't expect you to remember all the details of this. You've read it a long time ago. But before I get to that, about what age were you when you read this? That one I remember because the, I we read it in my fourth grade class, which is um, nine years old. Okay. So at nine years old, you're reading about a high school student named Meg Murray and her younger brother, Charles Wallace, and their friend, Calvin O'Keefe. And basically it's a quest, right? Where the, the father who's a scientist has gone missing. He's disappeared. No one knows where he is for... Uh, a year, and suddenly out of kind of nowhere, this is the, the magic of children's literature, uh, someone arrives called Mrs. What's It? And Mrs. Wh What's It is one of these uh, creatures from another dimension who comes with information about the father. And she also has two friends, Mrs. Who, and Mrs. Witch. So Mrs. What's It, Miss, Mrs. Who, and Mrs. Witch become the uh, guides for these three youngsters who are able to find a wrinkle in time, a terraset, to be able to go into another dimension to follow the trail of the missing father. Now, so what we have then is this notion of uh, searching for a parent, which is something I think all children can probably relate to. You know, the father's missing. What can I do to find my dad? What help can I find? And it goes back to your earlier point, we're social creatures. We seek other people around us that we trust to help us on our quest. This goes you know, from the Lord of the Rings to A Wrinkle in Time. It's the same kind of dynamic as you find your allies, those people that you've bonded with who see the world pretty much like you do, that will watch your back when you're going into the unknown. So what I like uh, about the story is the secret weapon that Meg discovers uh, you know, through Mary's trials and tribulations or, of trying to find the father. And ultimately, she goes back to confront this dark 
AI kind of force, which has taken over and made everything the same and controls the mind of everyone within this AI's domain. Except Mrs. What's It says, there is a secret weapon. You have to look deep in yourself and you'll find it. If you can find that weapon and you go back to this place and use it, you will be able to find and retrieve your father. Do you remember what the weapon was? Um, Love. Yes, that's <laughs> what I was going to say. Right. Yeah, that was a little, it was a little corny there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yes. Uh, corny in a way, but uh, on the other hand, very humanizing because right. it is, again, with that notion of self-sacrifice. And maybe that's something that we do well as humans and maybe we should do better. But the, the real notion of love is that ability to sacrifice yourself for another. It's not necessarily just the romantic part of it. It's a self-sacrifice. And here's a daughter who is willing to self-sacrifice for her father. That disabled the AI. AI was defeated at that point. Gosh, I don't even remember that it was an AI. Was it, was it a machine? Well, it, I, 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 I'm saying an AI. It's called IT, capital right. I-T. Right, okay, I do remember that. Yeah, yeah. and... It's, uh, my notes here, all objects and places appear exactly alike because the whole planet must conform to the terrifying rhythm pulsation of it. A giant disembodied brain. Now, that seems to me to be a reasonably good description <laughs> of, for a child of what an AI is. Yeah. This big disembodied brain. Right. Uh, in this case, uh, having a kind of super level uh, of intelligence as opposed to the kind of uh, AI intelligence that confuses uh, a writing of iPod for an Apple. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, the thing I re that, that for me that stands out in my memory about this book is is First of all, the female, the, the female scientists, like both Meg and her mother, her mother was a brilliant scientist. And yes. I really, you know, I think this was one of the first books I had read or encountered that, that had such characters that had female scientists, people who are interested in science. And, um, and also this notion of multiple dimensions. That was sort of my first, introduction to that idea of like the fourth dimension and this uh, notion of a tesseract and i remember that very clearly that that you know explaining that this is a four-dimensional cube and uh, and it was just fascinating to me i i think that's exactly the kind of thing i was hoping to hear is that here is a book that opened up the the role of genders mm -hmm. and that you could you could see for the first time as a, as a child that women are as capable as men and that women can be scientists, that they can also head up a quest and an mm -hmm. adventure. It doesn't have to be a boy. It right. can be a girl <laughs> who actually does all the hard work of putting together the team charting the journey, assessing the risks, and ultimately finding the solution. So that must have uh, made a, a bit of a change in terms of how you thought about your own potential as a young girl. It, it probably did. You know, I don't remember that explicitly, but I do remember, you know, very much identifying with the Meg character. Right. And and also just being very intrigued by her mother. You know. Right. Because so at that the, the, time my, my my own mother at that time was was a housewife. <laughs> yes. 
Okay. My father was an engineer. Uh, you know, I hadn't really encountered women doing being scientists. <laughs> But maybe that's part of the real beauty of early reading is it provides multiple role models for children. Because when you grow up, your role models are your mom, your dad, okay? I have a model of a man as an engineer, a model of a woman as a housemaker. And suddenly you're reading a book where, you know, there are other models out there. There are other kinds of things that people do, other kinds of identities that they're able to shape and create a life with. So yeah. that, uh, uh, so that, that book I could see would be uh, a quite important foundational one for your own kind of psychological development and perhaps confidence that, yeah, th there are some other roles out there for women other than which just what I'm saying around me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> okay, so to leave the world of fiction for a moment, to look at the, the next book on your list, which is The Universe and Dr. Einstein by Lincoln Barnett. Now, I've heard you say on another uh, webcast that you read this in high school, and it was responsible for you to pursue a degree in physics. Right. So that I, I absolutely I read that in high school. I think it was suggested by my physics teacher. And I absolutely loved it. You know, it was it was a popular exposition of Einstein's theory of relativity. Right. Uh, it was fairly short, extremely clear and well written. And it just, you know, uh, astounded me, th these ideas. Yeah. And the fact that you could just, you know, Einstein relied quite a bit on thought experiments, you know, uh, what she called Gedanken experiments, uh, where he didn't actually have a lab or, or, or you know, be doing, yeah. you know, writing down lots of equations, but he was just kind of thinking about how things might work and thinking, you know, well, what happens if, the speed of light is constant. What would what would that imply? And all of that was just very eye opening for me. And I decided I wanted to uh, study physics in college. It's interesting. <laughs> it, uh, again, I can see a little bit of a link here between the wrinkle of time because <laughs> he's dealing with other dimensions, and mm -hmm. also he's dealing with reasoning not in a lab, but by way of analogy, by way mm -hmm. of visualization. So he's using metaphors and he's using concrete examples of trains moving in order for that thought experiment to uh, allow, in which he's doing a reversal. He's using analogies as a reversal process to come up with an abstraction about an aspect of time, space, velocity, momentum, and to come up with the mathematics of the metaphors that he thought at his desk. Exactly. Yeah. So that was, that was quite, quite fascinating for me. <laughs> so again, I, I think you know, I can see this a little bit in your own work that you, you're able to see the, the metaphor making isn't just a translation of the hard mathematics. Einstein in this book, The Universe and, and, and uh, Dr. Einstein, shows that it can go the other way as well. You can go from the childlike storytelling of multidimensions to creation of mathematical models that try to come up with a more abstract, general way of explaining what a phenomenon is. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. I mean, much later, I, I read another book, uh, you know, now as an adult, uh, about Einstein. And um, it, it, it hypothesized that, you know, Einstein was a patent officer in Switzerland. And one of the things that people in Switzerland were trying to do at the time 
uh, was how do you synchronize clocks between train stations? Because this was an important thing to make trains, you know, sure. be able to follow their schedule. So, so he was thinking about this extremely practical problem, but thinking about the implications of what does it mean to synchronize? What does it mean for time to be synchronized? And blowing that up into this incredibly profound truth about the universe and about time itself. <laughs> so, you know, that, that was, that, that is, you know, that, that's like, as you say, it's kind of the reverse metaphor. It's like right. he sees the very concrete thing of trains and synchronization sure. and so on. And then he is able to expand that idea into something much more general and much more profound. You wonder if he had that kind of aha moment because, you know, the, the history of our species, you know, for 200,000 years would have been, we think of time as absolute, of space mm -hmm. as unchanging and absolute. And suddenly to have a thought, it's not absolute, it's relative. And to take that on, the implications of that on, and I think we're, we're still trying to come to terms with the implications of what that means with time being relative. Because all of our earthly experiences uh, prepare us for kind of an absolute, absolutist notion of time. And here's someone who challenged what is probably one of the bedrock notions that most people have. And I can see you're in high school now, and you're thinking, if time can, is not absolute and can be challenged, what else is there in <laughs> physics that will allow me to do similar kinds of challenges to what are basic understandings of the world, which work on one level, but are fundamentally incorrect? <laughs> Yeah, I don't know if I was thinking all that, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, I didn't. Yeah, I was trying to just get my mind around that, that whole very counterintuitive those ideas. Yes, yes. <clears throat> so by the time you're in high school, you've decided that physics is uh, the career path that you want to wanted to take, and you've. You've said that this, this particular book is one of the books that probably was influential in setting you on that path. Yes. So again, I think it shows childhood reading has enormous implications because what it does is it starts a train of thought and that train of thought leads people into a, a direction which they may not have otherwise taken but for having come across and read that book. Absolutely. Yes. The next book, Fads, Fallacies in the Name of Science by Martin Gardner. I, I hadn't been familiar with this book, but it's an absolutely timely book to, to discuss. I mean, this is pre-internet, pre-fake news, you know, pre-silos uh, uh, on Twitter and Facebook and the rest of it, he's taking on the whole kind of area of quack remedies, of cranks, and how cranks have, you know, historically been able to get quite a good audience. They didn't need social media to come along to give them an audience. I mean, now that has been quite effective, but before... Uh, they had publishers uh, right. that were quite willing <laughs> to publish their books because there was an audience for what Cranks uh, had to say, even though it was clearly wrong. Uh, so tell me a little bit about what age you were and the circumstances of coming across this book. So... I think I was in college. Uh, I don't quite remember, but yeah. um, I loved Martin Gardner. You know, he was a longtime columnist for Scientific American. He was a 
incredible communicator of math. Okay. He was a, a math puzzle fanatic and yes. a math puzzle creator um, and a wonderful writer, uh, just super playful uh, person interested in all kinds of things. So I, I had been reading, you know, I read his column and I picked up, I guess I picked up this book and uh, found it really just, you know, thinking about what drives people to believe things and what sort of, and as you say, it's very relevant now is sort of what is science? How do, how, why do we believe science? Why, what, what is different between science and all these kind of quack sure. beliefs? <laughs> and that's something, you know, I, I think we all still struggle with. I, I think it's, it's probably right. I mean, one of the things that seemed to me uh, from my reading of the book is the central role that uh, Gardner thought that the uh, scientific community played. And again, it goes back to that kind of social role that we are social people and that we learn from each other. And usually he says the crank is someone who's almost always outside the scientific community. They don't have colleagues to bounce the ideas off. They're not going to conferences, listening to other people's papers. They're not presenting their papers for peer review or for comment by other people. And as a result, it's easy to get off the rails because there's no one to say you're off the rails. Right, and they, they get these cult followings where they get reinforced, you know, people, people are believing them. And yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <clears throat> and he, he said that there, there are really uh, uh, a couple of signifiers for a crank is one of them is that person stands entirely outside the closely integrated channels through which new ideas are introduced and evaluated. And secondly, is a tendency to paranoia. <laughs> but I think one of the things that people may say is, well, the scientific community is not that perfect. Uh, that maybe some of the grants and the money that comes from them are twisting the, the dogma in ways that favor the people who are funding studies and so forth. And therefore, can we really trust dogma that's coming out of a scientific community that is not as pure science as we would wish it to be. Sure, that and um, science is done by humans, right? And humans have their own prejudices and uh, biases and influences and it's just a human endeavor but what we do have in science is we we have replication we have you know community sort of think things are wrong all the time but uh, eventually people discover that they're wrong uh we have kind of this notion of consensus there's certain things that are a consensus eventually in the scientific community and that those consensus, the consensus belief can eventually be overturned. But um, it's, it, 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 it's, it is a community. And I think, you know, it's, it's, it has a, a, I don't know how to say this. It's, it, it's, you know, why should we trust scientists as opposed to anyone else? It's, it's because I think scientists are, I mean, part of the, the, the deal of being a scientist is that you're always trying to disprove your own work and you try it as hard as you can. And that's the fundamental thing. You always are trying to be skeptical of everything in your own work. And if you pound on it and pound on it and people replicate it and replicate it, finally you come to uh, as close as you can to what you might call verification. So, no, yeah, I mean, <laughs> it's imperfect I, I, for sure. That, that's, that's a very good uh, description. I mean, I, I think in terms of sciences, also it creates a cultural, cultural aspect of thinking where 
scientists tend to be comfortable with uncertainty, at least more comfortable than most people, because they understand that even the existing dogma is a tentative position. It's not yet disproved. There will be flaws in it in that every time someone thinks they've come up with an absolute answer, they've usually found out that that's not the case. And so the, there is more of a humility. Uh, I mean, you have some big eagles in science, as you would I- expect. But the idea is to be humble in, in, in the face of new changing information that requires constant reevaluation and updating, where the people who are the cranks have the absolute truth. There is no updating that is needed. It's all defense of the existing structure. The structure is perfect. It can't be improved upon. And you, you either believe this or you don't. You're either part of a, our belief system or you're not. That, it seems to me, is very anti-scientific. So the, so the book by Gardner, and his, his books have appeared on the list of other guests as well. <laughs> He's someone who's had, I think, a profound influence in terms of educating uh, a whole a couple of generations of thinkers and mathematicians and physicists and artists and others who want to look deeply at, to, at those kinds of ways of thinking and processing reality. And science is just a different way of processing reality through investigation, observation, testing, reevaluation, and understanding that no matter what the result appears to show today, it may be overturned in the next week. I think one other thing you can say about Martin Gardner is that he, he was an incredible uh, expositor of science and sure. math and she kind of was a model for me in myself of trying to write a, write for the general public about about science how do you make things clear how do you make things entertaining how do you right. make things accessible I, I'm glad you mentioned that because the reviews of your books uh, all point to the fact that you've done this with an, with enormous success is to be able to use those metaphors and analogies to go from the very hard mathematical world of a pure science into another language that most people can understand and relate to, that's a, that's a very particular skill. Uh, it's, it's a little bit like translation. I mean, where, where I live, translation is a very important aspect of life. And you get people who are, say, bilingual. But as, as I say, there's a difference between being bilingual and bicultural. Mm-hmm. To know another language is not necessarily to know that culture. You are bilingual and bicultural, and that's a real advantage. And I think someone like Martin Gardner was like that as well, uh, who, who understood both cultures and understood the language and the barriers of communication between those cultures. Yeah. So I, uh, I just for the, for the people uh, watching, some of the uh, chapters in uh, this book uh, by Martin Gardner on fads and fallacies, uh, he takes on the flat earth people the hollow earth, I hadn't heard that one before, monsters of doom, flying saucers, uh, down with Einstein, dousing rods and doodle bugs, geology versus Genesis, uh, Atlantis, the great pyramids, medical cults uh, from uh, homeopathy to naturopathy, and food fattest, So uh, Dynetics, so he covers a fair range of the traditional kind of cult-like absolutist fad trends that a lot of people uh, were attracted to. 
and still are in it's, some cases. It, it, <laughs> it still are. And as a result, maybe this is a book that has to be updated for uh, modern times uh, because social media now is the, the main vehicle through the internet of being able to create these kinds of pseudoscientific communities, which they talk to each other and reinforce each other, but they're reinforcing basically a highly flawed, mistaken view of reality. So the question is, how do you reach them? Uh, Martin Gardner's book reached you and probably reached a lot of people of, of your generation. But the question is, is for the new generation, it, will this book be one that will allow them to have a different window on mm -hmm. social media once they've read it? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know if books are even relevant anymore for a lot of people. <laughs> well, this is, this is becoming uh, an issue, and it's part of the reason for the show, is to show the relevance of books. They've been very relevant in your life. I very mean, so far, so, so far, when we, the books that we've gone through, we've seen uh, the, the Professor Mitchell emerge as a mathematician, <laughs> as a physicist, and as a computer science, artificial intelligence person. That, that part of that process, I'm certain it's, far more complex, and of course, complexity is another one of your, your areas, more complex than just childhood reading, but childhood reading is part of that nonlinear interplay of factors that have made you construct a model of reality that has served you very well. Mm -hmm. So the idea is, when people say books are not relevant, I think they're missing a very key important role in how they're relevant and why they're relevant at a particular age. Right, I mean, I was saying that facetiously, of course. Yeah. But, you know, the young people I know today are, tend to read a lot less, a fewer books than I did as a child. They're, they're reading things on the internet, as you say. Right. We didn't have a choice. We, we only had books. <laughs> Correct. So you're, you're probably finding this then in your students? At, uh, in my Sunday? students. Oh, yeah. In my students, my own children. Uh, they, they just have so many different options for media that uh, books, you know, books are not number one on their list, I think, <laughs> the way they were for me, All which right. is too bad. Which yeah, is too yeah. bad. Yeah. Well, let, let's hope that this interview, this conversation, will inspire young people to say, I want to be like Melanie <laughs> Mitchell. I would love to be able to follow that career path. And here, if it worked for her, maybe this will be the kind of fine tuning that will help <laughs> sculpt my own mind in a similar direction. That's the goal. Uh, we'll see, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the next uh, book is One, Two, Three, Infinity by George uh, Gamow, uh, Gamow, uh, yeah, Gamow. Uh, which came out in 1947 and explores the fundamental concepts of mathematics and science. And Tell us a little bit about uh, your initial reading of the book. Yeah, so this one I read in college. Okay. Uh, and, you know, was thinking about all these fundamental ideas, you know, fascinated to read all of this stuff. I don't, you know, I, I remember being very Im impressed and influenced by it. Um, although I don't totally remember all the content of the book, <laughs> but yeah. I do remember it was very, uh, about very fundamental ideas, especially in mathematics. There, there, there are two points in my research of the book that uh, now make me think uh, it had an influence on you. Is one, it's noted for its quirky sense of humor. 
<laughs> uh, that seems to be something that's a thread through all the books that we've looked at so far. And secondly, it's noted for its memorable metaphors. Ah. Again, again something that is a thread through all the books that you've chosen uh, that mm -hmm. influenced you as a child. So you were growing up probably without realizing it, that you were having a master class with some of the best mentors on the planet uh, teaching metaphorical thinking and teaching humor and ways of entertaining to get people's attention and to explain sometimes very hard, difficult, abstract uh, concepts like number theory, uh, yeah. which uh, is done in, the, in this book. Yes, absolutely. So I think a lot of these books, I, I, just, I kind of read them and almost, you know, the way that like a film student will analyze a film yeah. at a much more kind of like trying to figure out how did how did the director pull that off? How did they right. set up that scene? Yeah, yeah. And I was quite interested in how do you explain things to people? Yeah. You know, how do you explain these hard concepts? So I was looking at how are they how are they doing this? How is George Gamoff actually pulling this off? <laughs> you know, it's it's true because uh, I think it's a very insightful uh, uh, observation you've made because in in, in a sense books like this are a kind of performance art. And if I look at the other people who have uh, cited this book as foundational, they are some of the great science communicators. For example, uh, theoretical physicist Sean Carroll mentions this, one, two, three, infinity, as setting the trajectory of his professional life. Mm -hmm. uh, cognitive scientist Steven Pinker read the book as a child and cited it's contributing to his interest in popular science. Mm -hmm. And astrophysicist uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson has also cited this as one of the greatest of two books uh, that had an impact on his development. The other one being James uh, Newman's Mathematics and Imagination. So here you have three other great scientific translators, communicators, masters of the metaphor, who have had this book come into their life at the right time to say, beyond just metaphor and simile and analogy, you have to find ways to entertain people. And the entertainment is the way that most people learn. And if you're asking them to go back and do all the foundational for the original abstraction, say, of number theory, they're not going to follow you there. They're not going to go down that path. But if you can give them a watchdog, a dog with a clock-like body, <laughs> they're going to stay with you and follow yes. you down the path because right. it is fun. Right. And I think George Gamow also, you know, he... He was Russian. Yes. And he had that kind of very dry wit that the Russian yeah. Russian writers often have. And yes. That was something I really appreciated. So humor and metaphor from George Gamma, uh, one, two, three, and infinity, a book which uh, clearly has inspired you and some of the other uh, very important scientific communicators out there. Uh, cite this book as well, which takes us uh, to your next book, which is a book of essays by one of the world's foremost astronomers, Beyond the Observatory by Harlow uh, Shapley, uh, which is essays on scientific uh, achievements of the 20th century. And one of the things which I thought was kind of a, a uh, an interesting uh, presentation, Breathing the Future in the Past. I don't know if you recall that essay or not, mm. but it was showing how your breath contains more than 400,000 Aragon atoms that Gandhi breathed in his long life. To, yeah, I do remember that. 
of yeah. bringing science uh, again alive with uh, an illustration here uh, that makes it very vivid. Yes. When when did you come? Was this uh, uh, at high school, college? You came across that this? was in college. I in, during college I became very interested in astronomy mm -hmm. and. Um, started to actually do some research in astronomy. We had a s small observatory that I got involved in sort of a group of students who were doing uh, independent research in, in astronomy. And so I picked up this book and I one essay that I remember really clearly was um, a discussion about how much you can infer from a, a, a sort of a single pinpoint of light you know you're looking at a star yeah, yeah. all you're getting is very you know a pinpoint of light and then you can infer like what is the chemical makeup of the star how old is it where it fits on the sort of spectrum of of different kinds of stars is it you can infer is it orbiting another star is it it can explode you know all of these different things it's just astounding what astronomy can achieve with just this incredibly kind of, uh, it, you know, seemingly very limited amount of data. So I was very struck by that essay. Did you think of a career in uh, astronomy? Yeah, I did. I did think for a long time that I was going to, to have a career in astronomy, and I did a several internships in astronomy labs mm -hmm. and thought about going to graduate school in astronomy, but ended up not doing that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so I, I guess maybe one of the lessons is that you can be intrigued and enthralled by a particular book that led you in a direction, but ultimately you decide that's not exactly the full direction of where you want to go. You learn from it and you learn something about yourself from it and take on that knowledge, but get on with uh, another career path. Mm -hmm. Yes, life is full of twists and turns, of course. Right. <laughs> that you don't predict, you can't predict. The, uh, the, uh, the other essay, which kind of fits into uh, the, some of the other books that uh, we've discussed, is The Science Outside the Lab. Uh, which was one of the essays there, and again, which take is which is back to the Einstein book that we discussed earlier, and uh, that the, there is this kind of notion that science isn't just something that happens in the labor laboratory. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't remember that particular essay. Mm -hmm. But I assume he was talking about sort of the what you see out in real life. Right. I mean, what kind of science takes place, you know, you, by observations that are outside of the lab, just like Einstein. Right, and and again, what uh, Shapley's book, from from my understanding of these essays, is it's looking at science in a broad way. It's looking at science, sociology, and philosophy as well. In other words the broader context in which science exists. It's a culture within a larger culture. Mm -hmm. And it's, you are one of the bridge builders <clears throat> that are crossing that moat where the scientists are inside talking to each other in a language which would be incomprehensible for most of us listening to ancient Greek. <laughs> <laughs> but you've mastered that language and can go over and say, this is what they're really talking about. This is what it really means. Here are some examples. Visualize this, visualize mm -hmm. that. Which talking and visualization takes us to Hin's Teeth, Horse, Horses Tolls by Stephen Gould, uh, which a wonderful writer. I mean, I'm mean getting, waiting for my Smithsonian Institute magazine to arrive here in Bangkok back in the early 90s. Uh, and sometimes it wouldn't arrive because I, there must have been a postman who shared my interest, decided to keep it himself. 
But in any event, uh, he had a wonderful mind. And tell us how this book came into your life. Um, so when I was in college, one of my housemates was an evolutionary biology major. Okay. And he was telling me how I should learn something about this field because I knew nothing about it. I'd never taken a biology class. Uh, so I tried to get into, there was a po very popular course on evolutionary biology in my college, which I was unable to get into because it was so popular. So this housemate gave me this book, he said, read this, this will teach you everything you need to know about. <laughs> and I had never heard of Stephen Jay Gould. Um, I didn't know anything about evolution. Sure. Um, so it was a real eye opener. It, it was a, you know, he's a fantastic writer, just like, you know, this is kind of all of these books are uh, these master science uh, expositors and talking about some of the, these sort of in really interesting questions that you would never have thought to ask right. about evolution. Right. So this, this was my first introduction to a lot of these ideas. Yeah. What, what would you think would have been the influence of, of the book on your own thinking and your own choices and career? <laughs> well, it, 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 got, it sort of it sparked my interest in ideas of evolution, which okay. then, you know, went a lot further, especially when I um, was in graduate school and it encountered an entire field called, called biologically inspired computation and evolutionary computation, which merged ideas from evolution into computer science. And um, it's something that I got very deeply involved with yeah. later on. <laughs> so so it, it, really, yeah, go that, ahead. That's, that's, a, that's, that's an interesting point because in some ways you, you're drawing an analogy from the evolutionary biology world of uh, Stephen Gould into a quite different realm and seeing that that perspective is transferable. Yes, exactly. That, that you can use, you could be inspired in a metaphorical way by ideas in one field uh -huh. and apply them into other fields. And, and interestingly, uh, that's exactly what happened with Darwin you know, who <laughs> sort of came up with a lot of these ideas. He was inspired by ideas from economics, from geology and other fields and brought that into his own ideas about biology. Yeah. So there's a lot of these cross scientific analogies going on. It's an excellent point because certainly with Darwin's generation, there would have been a far broader education. And maybe that's part of the problem we are we have with AI <laughs> is that people are brilliant, but narrowly brilliant in very specific subdomains of subdomains. And so as right. a result, there isn't the same kind of cross fertilization of ideas. Uh, like for example, talking with someone who's uh, coding an algorithm about empathy, there may not be an easy bridge with that uh, colder and with those kinds of concepts, simply because the background isn't there. They haven't come across the Stephen Gould model that you, what you do is you find someone who is able to explain something brilliantly and see, again, it's you drew the metaphor of what he's talking about into another realm. You transported mm -hmm that infrastructure, that framework of thinking, and allowed you to see something quite different about computers that other people were not seeing. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, I think I, I would say I was the one who came up with some of those analogies, but my some of my mentors did. Right. Yeah. Well, talking about mentors, let's, uh, let's move on to Goethe, Escher, and Bach by... Douglas Hofstadter, who I know 
uh, was uh, your mentor and an important uh, intellectual force in your life. Uh, this book in 1973 was uh, a monumental uh, work. It won a Pulitzer Prize. It is still read and discussed and has shaped thinking of uh, a couple of generations uh, since it was first uh, published. So you must have read this book uh, before you decided to, this was going to be your thing. Uh, you were at university somewhere, you got the book, what happened next? So I was actually, I read it um, the, the year after I graduated from college. Okay. Um, I had actually read about it, I read a review of it in Martin Gardner's column in Scientific American. <laughs> which is how I had heard about it in the first place. Right. So I went out and bought it. And um, it's a very long book. It's not, a, it's not a, like a beach read, if you will. It's, it takes a lot of thinking. So I read it over the course of many months and decided that this, you know, this is what I want to work on. And it's, it's a really a book about, it's about uh, intelligence and how in something like intelligence, as complex as intelligence can emerge from a non-intelligent substrate, how, how consciousness might come about. And, and it uses ideas from mathematics, from music, from art to, to um, kind of il 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 illuminate these core ideas. Yeah. What was the connecting thread that Hofstetter uh, discovered that links together Goethe and Bach and Escher? Um, there were, I have to say there are several connecting threads, but maybe one of them is this idea of self-reference that is fundamental in, in Gödel's theorem, his mathematical theorem, because you can get mathematical uh, systems to be talking about themselves, to be referring to themselves. And that's shows up in Escher, you know, you, you see all these kinds of strange kind of loopy references. The hand Escher. drawing the hand. Yeah, the hand drawing the hand and so on. Um, and in Bach's music too, there's some uh, examples that Hofstetter goes into in, in detail. And um, this is really the idea of intelligence is a self-referential, what he calls a strange loop, the strange loop of consciousness, where we're able to reflect on our own thinking. A, a kind of recursion. A kind of recursion, exactly. That, that, that goes on, that we, we think, uh, and, and a kind of a meta-thinking as well, so that at each stage recursive, Part. I mean, with box cubes, for example, there is a thing that reoccurs in them. Uh, you know, from from uh, Nietzsche's uh, eternal return, there there are things that are patterns that show up again, slightly altered, but recognizable, and exactly. that 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 is uh, the nature of uh, intelligence as as we understand it. Something like that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's a... Hofstadter's ideas are not easily expressible in a you know, short period of time. So, so, but that's kind of getting at the idea of this, uh, this what he calls this strange loop. W and, would you say that th this, I mean, this is an absolutely foundational book but maybe it's at the outer edge of where you can use metaphor and similar with these abstractions to convey uh, accurately what is being talked about. Because a lot of people find this book very, very difficult. Yeah, uh, it is difficult. Um, but what's really striking is how much Hofstadter comes up with amazing analogies and metaphors to talk about these things. Uh, and that's really turns out to be what he's most fascinated by is how we think in analogies and metaphors. Okay. 
and he is a master of using these, you know, language uh, and everyday examples to try and illustrate what's going on in these incredibly abstract ideas. So he's uh, a, a master cultural uh, translator yes, from these various say. realms. Yes. And again, using what, I mean, I can see the influence because you've, you've done a number of articles on metaphor and analogy, particularly in the, in the context of AI. Uh, so that understanding by way of metaphor and analogy has obviously been very central to your own development as a scientist and as an interpreter of science to a larger community. And yeah, and, and, and in fact, you know, Hofstadter was the one who introduced me to the idea of uh, building AI systems that can make analogies. That was the topic of my PhD dissertation for which he was the advisor. Right. So this notion of uh, uh, analogy and metaphor kind of circles through all of my research. <laughs> <laughs> and it certainly circles through all of your readings as well. <laughs> Evidently. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're starting to discover a, a certain kind of pattern yeah. that started at age eight. Yeah. I never had made that connection. <laughs> It's kind of like psychotherapy, right? <laughs> it's like it's all started in your childhood. <laughs> Are you still in contact with uh, Professor Hofstadter? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Talk to him from time to time. Okay. So uh, the the next book, uh, unless there's something else you'd, you'd like to to say about that, no, I think we've kind of established the fact that yeah. it's been transformational. I mean. Your PhD thesis was about analogies, about a man who had written a book filled full of analogies and metaphors. And that was a watershed book and a watershed period of your life. Absolutely, yeah. The Recursive Universe by William Poundstone, uh, which is really kind of the origin of complexity, which I know is another one of the fields that you've done uh, a fair amount of research and study and writing. Um, uh, explain a little bit about how this book came to you and what, uh, what it said to you about complexity that still is important to you. Yes. So this book, I believe I read it in graduate school. Um, okay. It, I don't remember how I came across it, <laughs> right. but it, what it is, is it's, it's a, a, it takes John Conway's game of life, right? which is a, what's called a cellular automaton. Uh, yeah. It's not exactly a game. It's more like a, a, a very idealized model, um, a very simplified model of complex systems. And it uses this game of life and all, game of life is, is full, full of little patterns that people have discovered in this, uh, uh, like things that are gliders and uh, other kinds of structures that can do all kinds of computations. Uh, and, and Poundstone uses this as uh, a sort of way to talk about bigger ideas in cosmology and physics. And, uh, and it's just fascinating kind of approach to talking about those ideas. And it was my introduction, it was one of my introductions to the game of life. Okay. Um, and think you've seen sort of how complex that all is and how complexity can emerge from these very simple rules and then tying it to these much bigger ideas. So I just loved that book. I thought it was beautiful and it's not that well known. I mean, it's, it, I'm, it's surprisingly, uh, I think, underappreciated. Yeah, I, I, I think uh, from what I've read, of, I haven't read the book, but I've uh, read a, about it and it seems absolutely fascinating in terms of 
of this notion of self-assembly, of mm-hmm. how you can get very complex systems out of something that is in itself very simple. And he, for example, he gives the example of pi, where you know basically uh, you can uh, encode it using only two terms and end up with this unbelievably complex uh, number from just the initial uh, two right components to begin with. So I, I, that I thought was a, a quite interesting aspect of it. And the other thing is the initial information input and the relationship of inf- information with intra- entropy of mm-hmm. you know Claude uh, Shannon with with Boltzmann of looking at those two aspects of the universe as it uh, uh, as uh, from an in- informational model to a model of uh, the second law of thermodynamics or entropy where things will go into greater disorder. Yes, exactly. So this book brought together a lot of ideas of complex systems that I had been thinking a little bit about, but never really found them brought all together, including entropy, information, computation. You know, he shows, Mm -hmm. he he talks about Conway's proof that uh, the game of life, which is just, uh, it's just a two dimensional grid of, of, of black and white uh, what they call cells that sure. influence each other in simple ways, but that this actually you can embed an entire computer in this incredibly simple system, and it's it's just it's about full of very profound ideas. <laughs> I, I know at Santa Fe you uh, teach an online course on complexity, mm-hmm. which is highly popular. I read somewhere like twenty five thousand students. Have have yeah, taken more, more now. <laughs> yeah, what I read is probably outdated, yeah. but it seems to be a very popular. Course. Is this one of the books that's in the course? So I I don't use the book in that course, but I do talk about a lot of the ideas. I see. Yeah. Okay. So we do okay. cover that kind of thing. Yeah. Right. Okay. The last book on the list is Adaptations in Natural and Artificial Systems by John Holland. Last but not least, uh, here we have adaptation is a biological process, rearranging genetic material, goes back to what you're talking earlier about Darwin this, and in the evolutionary biology that uh, you found an attractive way to take into another domain. So uh, adaptation in natural and artificial system by John Holland, was this a, something from your university days or earlier? This was from graduate school. Okay. So John Holland was one of my professors at the University of Michigan. Right. And he, he taught a course by, he was a computer science professor, yet he taught a course in computer science called Adaptation in Natural and Artificial Systems. Uh, it's a very technical book. Um, so it's the only technical book on my list, really. Right. Um, but it was... This was, John Holland was the founder of this field called genetic algorithms, which brought ideas from evolutionary uh, evolutionary biology into computer science. Interesting. Uh, and this book was his, his theory of adaptation. So when you think about adaptation, maybe you think about, you know, some kind of species adapting to a particular niche, you know, uh, uh, for instance, you know, you have things like butterflies that um, the color of their wings change in response to their environment. And so this, this notion of adaptation is fundamental to biology. And yet Holland brought that into the field of computer science by saying what we want in computer science in AI is to have computers that adapt. So we don't want just living systems that adapt, we want machines that adapt, that are able to adapt to different environments and to to be able to be flexible and um, uh, learn the way that, that living systems do. 
So Holland became my co-advisor, along with Doug Douglas Hofstetter. And this book was, you know, sort of set the path of a lot of my future research for, for um, you know, up until now, really. Yeah. What, what seemed to me interesting about, about this book is the part that plays uh, just conceptually of kind of perpetual novelty. Oh, that, yes. there is, that there is no kind of end point uh, that it's aimed for a particular end point, that, that, that it's always open. And you can't quite predict where it will go, how that coevolution or that adaptation will go next. So that, I guess that's part of the nonlinearity that uh, he discusses in, in the book, is that we, we have trouble with things like exponential numbers, nonlinearity. These are things that are outside our realm of experience, like absolute time as opposed to relative time. And this is where you as a, a communicator of science try to come in and say, well, people are looking to take you to an endpoint, but you have to be careful because the way endpoints work in reality are quite different from the way that they're portrayed. Right. So one interesting thing about um, this idea of perpetual novelty that Holland talks about, you know, you, you can imagine that in biology where you're having species continually evolving and changing and the environment's changing. Sure. But Holland also brought these ideas into economics. Yes. So um, interestingly, you know, economics, the theory of economics that people, uh, the sort of classical economic theory has to do with equilibrium. You know, right. you want sort of this economic system to be in equilibrium or markets to be in equilibrium. But this idea of perpetual novelty says such systems are never in equilibrium. And therefore, the classical theories don't describe reality where we actually have this continually changing co-adaptive system of all of these economic agents. So that's really been revolutionizing a lot of thinking in economics as well as in biology and computer science. Yes. Yeah, that, that's, yeah. Uh, again, I guess uh, things like global optimum and equilibrium are uh, in a way uh, metaphorical, trying to create the notion that there's an end point where everything is absolutely balanced, as opposed to the fact that in reality, nothing is ever balanced for long. There may be moments in time where it appears that birds and rabbits and dinosaurs had a particular adaptation, but then it doesn't last. It's overtaken by something else. And as a result, you have to live with the uncertainty of a perpetual uh, changing environment and adaptation to those changes. Yes. I think uh, one of your previous guests, uh, John Allen Paulos, has a great quote where he says, you know, living with uncertainty is the only certainty. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, that, that's something that I could uh, I just uh, uh, hear John saying. John's a friend. Yes. I've known him for years. Yeah, very, very brilliant mathematician. And again, a communicator of, of a high level, uh, as you are as well. <laughs> so I want to thank you for this been a delightful conversation. Let me know, what, what do you think about the experience of being on the show? Um, it's been a lot of fun. I mean, it's intimidating to, to try and have to think back on books that I've read years and years and years ago. <laughs> but you reminded me of a lot of things that I'd forgotten, which has been great. And you also pointed out so many connections that I had never made about, you know, different, uh, the books, these books that I've read and the things that I've been thinking about for a long time. So I thank you for that. <laughs> and thank you. Uh, this has been a wonderful conversation and I will continue to, to follow your writings and learn from them. Uh, you are a, a master of communication. Uh, 
between the arts and the science, and you contribute to both. And I think you have done uh, a great job in that communication. Please keep well, up this you. wonderful work. Thank you so much. Bye for now. Okay, bye-bye.